Hello, hello. It's very nice to be back here in Sydney. I noticed the new addition of blankets down the front, so if you, you know, feel like you'd like to cuddle up from up there, do come down the front. There's lovely warm blankets. Am I selling it? Okay, so yes, I am uh, Relly Annette Baker. I am a content strategist, um, which means, uh, well, it means all kinds of things, but most of the time it means that I'm running headlong into problems with uh, companies who are like, we've got a website. <laughs> That's as far as they've got with the process. So my job is to try and help them along. And this talk, Future Perfect Tense here, is about creating good content on an imperfect web. And I say an imperfect web because, well, if you were in Scott's session this morning, you would have heard some of the stuff that we're, we're looking at in terms of what direction things are going. Good news, if you weren't in Scott's session, you're probably going to get the 10-minute recap from me because some of the stuff is kind of similar. Um, and an imperfect web for me is actually the best sort of web. It allows us to experiment, create stuff, try new things. There's no prescribed way of doing stuff. Um, I'm a big believer that, that best practice is bullshit. There's only good practice for whatever context you're in. So let's talk a little bit about that. So the other thing I should tell you is Theoretically, if you follow me on Twitter, that would be really AB, you will get fun footnotes as we go along in this talk. I have no idea if it's going to work. We'll find out. Uh, all the footnotes I will publish on my blog along with the slides of this uh, sometime today. Uh, but yeah, OK, here we go. So, so we're here. This is me. This is the pink hair edition of Rally. Uh, you've got red hair. I've, I've been blue hair in between, but so if you see a photo of someone who looks like me but with different color hair, it probably is me. So you should be fine on that. Now let's talk about future perfect tense. This is a bit of a grammarian nerdy thing here. Future perfect tense is one of the most complicated aspects of language to explain, language syntax to explain, I should say. If you have small children, as I do. Um, you can have loads of fun with them around the age of three as they try and express stuff in terms of things that have happened and things that will happen in the future. And, and, and most kids go through a stage of describing everything that's happened before is yesterday and everything that happens in the future is next week. So Christmas is next week. There is only one week of the year in which that is a happy face that you can give to that. Um, but it's best described as the state of something from the past as viewed from the future, which is kind of complicated. So you can see this here. Here's the past, here's our timeline, here's the present. In the future tense, you, sir, you there, you move to London. It's very exciting for you, I'm excited. It's kind of colder than it is here, the coffee's not as good, but the people are just as arsy, so you should be fine. At this point, uh, further in the future, you will have forgotten me which is sad for me and you both, I'm sure, but there'll be too many RC people in London for you to care. So that is future perfect tense. And now, the thing is, like I say, for children, this is a really hard construct to describe. And actually, most language syntax, children cling on to you really well. They get stuff, they start forming their own words, ones that they haven't heard. So that's where you get children saying, I bide this, rather than I bought this, even though they haven't really heard anyone use that because the syntax makes sense to them. They struggle with this, though. However, you as a grown-up are really good at this. I can't even begin to tell you how well you have managed this construct. By arbitrary, ill-conceived date in the future, our website will have already been launched three whole months. We can totally commit to hard deadline for global rollout of new product. See, I told you, you're brilliant, you're pros already. Because don't tell me there hasn't been someone in the room here who has not at least been in a meeting room when this sort of thing has been uttered. Or, or better still, my favorite one is a conference call where you're sat there doing this, going, don't say that, don't say that. OK. So up until this point, we have had a pretty good grip on how this whole web thing works. A site is made of a repository of stuff, as we can see here. Uh, someone writes up some more stuff, uh, usually directly into the CMS, making full use of that WYSIWYG. Uh, then they choose a snazzy typeface to show how important it is. And uh, then and they check it out on this preview button here, a very important step. And then an internet happens. 
And of course, that process is repeated until you have a website. This is not a website. This is the Winchester Mystery House. Uh, it's in San Jose. Uh, it was built over a period of about 60 years um, in the early 20th century, or late 19th century, early 20th century, by Sarah Winchester, who was the heiress to the Winchester Rifles fortune, uh, the Winchester Rifles being things that shot a lot of people dead in America. Uh, so she had a choice once her, her, both her daddy and her husband had passed on and left her all this money. She could set up a charitable foundation to help the widows and children of those affected by the Winchester Rifles, or she could build a big fuck-off house in which to trap ghosts. <laughs> so she took the obvious choice. And so over the course of around uh, 60 years, she, she built this house along with her foreman, whose job it was to wake up every morning and say, so, Mrs. Winchester, what are we building today? And this continued. There was no particular plan or, uh, or construct. Her main thing was that she wanted to make a house that she wanted to live in, spend lots of money on, but also trap ghosts from getting her, which makes for a slightly complicated building plan. Um, there are, as it exists, and you can go see it in San Jose now and do a tour, there are around 160 to 180 rooms in uh, livable condition there at the moment, but with all the building and remodeling that went on, it was probably somewhere between 400 and 600 rooms that were created in her lifetime, including four ballrooms, one of which she has sealed from the outside world because ghosts. And whenever she decided that ghosts had got into a particular bit, she would just shut that bit of the house off and build a new one on top. So at its peak, there was six floors. Then there was an earthquake that happened in San Francisco that um, affected the area of San Jose, and it ended up as four floors. Uh, and she had a big hole in the wall, um, and so she decided the best thing to do here was to put a door on the front of the fourth floor with a sign that said, Road to Nowhere. Literally, you open it, you fall out. So yes, yeah, so she built higgledy-piggledy with no real consideration for what was going to go next. She just kept piling money into this building. It was her life's project. Things went on top. Whenever she needed a bedroom, she'd build a new bedroom. Whenever she needed a new ballroom, she'd build a new ballroom. And can anyone see in any way, shape, or form in which way this metaphor is going? <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is our average website today. However, someone, some absolute fucker, said, you know what would be cool? I want to see our website on a phone. I want to be an asshole at weddings, on the beach, in my car, in a speedboat. I want to be able to do all these things. I love the fact that's an actual advert. Um, and actually, this isn't anywhere near as new as companies like to pretend. I don't know if they, those of you remember like the Palm Pilot and the fact you could plug it in and get newspaper headlines on it, like in the 2000s or whatever. But anyway, so yes, suddenly we had to start creating these mobile versions, and we looked at what our websites were like on phones, and lo, they were shit. Suddenly, this pile of content that brick by brick, mortar by mortar, had gone to make this singular house that we were relying on had to go to all these other places. And this is what our content looked like. Still what it looks like to a certain extent, our content creators and, and more specifically, our content systems are not ready for this shift. We have not built things because we've been building off the idea of print. It's OK, though, because the designer has a plan. He's going to use Helvetica and create a mobile light version of the site, and everything will be fine. We've nailed this ship. Meanwhile, Companies are paralyzed by the fear of the unknown because this answer is suddenly not doing enough. Two years ago, having a mobile light version might just about carry you through. Two years on, we're suddenly looking at a whole proliferation of stuff. So first, we had tablets and mobiles, and we were building native apps, and that was ticking along fine, and we were doing all right. But now, the next big thing is a one-inch watch and a 50-inch smart TV. Are you still going to be happy serving up the desktop site? Are we going to hope to make a native app for each and every platform? That's just scary to me. And I, Scott covered this earlier from the point of view of designers and developers. For me, as a content creator, the idea, I mean, it's, I love the idea of having a parking meter that I will be able to, to go past and collect a ticket from. Who's going to write the content that goes in that parking meter? And how am I going to feed that to the parking meter? Am I going to have a proprietary app? for my parking meter to write the content to my parking meter? Are there going to be proprietary content management systems for parking meters? 
This starts getting very complicated very quickly. And so here we are with me and my colleagues. We are, to bring it back to the title of this talk, Future Perfect Tense. Say, a lot of business I've spoken to are considering putting a spending freeze on web stuff until they can work out what the future holds. Good luck with that. If we based our thinking on predictions, we'd all have made proprietary apps for our fridges to tell us when we're out of milk. The internet fridge, as Scott covered, is a hilarious concept, like, and it's one that's been touted for years, and I'd like to introduce you to the great and glorious Tumblr, Fuck Yeah Internet Fridge, by a friend of mine, Ree Reynolds, who is an extremely smart guy, and you should follow everything he does, but especially Fuck Yeah Internet Fridge. And there's a great one here, um, the, I, the, from the register, Russian antivirus Kaspersky lab is warning that in a few years, our fridges will be, like, they'll be using them as biological weapons by making our milk go off. Uh, Electrolux press release from 1999, there's no doubt that when the screen fridge hits the market, it will, and it goes on to say, revolutionize the kitchen. I'm still waiting, personally. Uh, all kinds of fun things about this. So why is the internet fridge so funny? Well, allow me to put it like this. So Tom Coates, who spoke here last year and talked about this kind of stuff, he, he, there's a video of the same sort of talk he did at an event called Mind the Product, and he says, he puts it this way, who buys an internet fridge and doesn't already own a tablet? Like, internet fridges are still luxury items. They're expensive to put together and expensive to sell, and you're going to own a tablet before you do that. So who goes, I've got an iPad, but I'd rather listen to music on my fridge? It just doesn't really happen. And my favorite thing here, which is also taken from Fuck Your Internet Fridge from Tom's talk, um, is this was from uh, an expo that happened in California of different technology items and things like that. And uh, this is a, an internet fridge with a note on it that says, why the fuck does my fridge need Twitter? It's a very good point. I don't really want my, my fridge tweeting me too often. OK. And if you want to see how good pundits are at predictions, you can Google what is actually the perfect time capsule, the iPhone will fail. And here you can see things like the Register and Bloomberg and stuff from around 2007 predicting why the iPhone would fail before it came on the market. And the reason they were doing this is that they were seeing, and they were still seeing this long after release, they were seeing a very expensive smartphone, not a very cheap personal computer, which is what the smartphone actually is to us. So, future perfect tense. This is how our content creators feel. This is how I feel right now. We know that our tools, our processes, our content is not ready for what is coming. Like, we can see this coming apocalypse, and we are scared that we are going to be left writing the proprietary stuff to make it work. When the CEO isn't attempting to be a clairvoyant, it is usually left to the content, marketing, web team, etc., to work out between them what the next best move is. And they're paralyzed by the fear that they have to create the perfect website and the perfect content for this future that's looming, you know, suddenly looming at them right now. The mobile web is a thing that is happening right now. And very soon, it's going to get to a point where we're going to have to stop calling it the mobile web. It's just going to be the web that people access on whatever device they choose. So while this is an admittedly uber nerdy grammarian joke, Future Perfect Tense describes the mental states of these creators. So these are the questions that I get when I go and see companies all the time. This is what I'm being asked by content creators. What is coming? How can we create for it? What, what tools can you give us to, to make this happen? Right, what, what are software developers made that can make this easier for us? How can we reduce duplication of effort between publishing departments? We're now suddenly all publishers whether we like it or not. And we've got different departments publishing at different times and schedules and calendars and things like that. How can we reduce this duplication of efforts so and when we're putting something to print, we can also use it on the web or vice versa? Should we be making native apps? Is that the answer? Pragmatically, possibly. Realistically, probably not. I don't know. Should we have a separate mobile team? This is my all-time favorite. No. 
because you wouldn't have a separate desktop team and a separate tablet team and a separate watch team and a separate toaster team and a separate fridge team, which is inevitably the direction that we're going in. If you need someone to help you with your mobile development now, that's fine, but don't make it an entrenched thing because then you've got to uproot it and replace it with something else later on. Especially when it comes to content, which is what we're really talking about here in my case, Having a separate mobile team means you're forking, and then we go back to the bad old days of having different browsers that displayed in different ways with different types of content, which is painful all around. Won't new content cost us money? No shit, Sherlock, I don't work for free. Yes, it will cost you money, but the difference is, from how people have been looking at it now, is that we can make content make money and bring benefits, we just have to be better at measuring that and measuring it from right from the beginning through to the end, rather than it being this, well, I'll talk about that later, this idea of a black hole that often happens. Isn't mobile where all the money is now? Well, if anyone paid any close attention to the Twitter IPO, you would have seen some stuff in there that was quite interesting about mobile revenue. And the same goes for Facebook and when they registered their IPO about the, the price of advertising and so on. So conventionally, Advertising terms, no. In terms of the stuff, the devices that people are going to have with them, now there's an interesting market. But just having just mobile-focused stuff is just about as bad as anything else, I think. And this, here comes my all-time favorite one. And to which you might notice, I don't really have any great answers for these. I'm just telling you what I get asked, because I'm still trying to work through these answers myself. This is my favorite one. Can't we just tell everyone to use the desktop site? I wish I could tell you this didn't, I didn't get asked this a lot. What, the point of this, what this usually happens to me is when we've had, I've had an impassioned meeting where I've explained about how we need to reorder the CMS, we need to think about content chunks, we need to be able to think about reuse, and so on. And someone at the back of the room who hasn't really spoken up, who's a senior stakeholder and is all a bit kind of, this is scary and sounds like it's going to cost a lot of money, says, can't we just tell everyone to use the desktop site? The thing is, you don't get to make that decision because people won't use it. Increasingly, it will be by what's easiest and what they have to hand. 17% of the American people only have access to the internet via phone, and 39% have their main access by phone. And from the Pew Internet report, uh, there's huge spikes with this with different um, ethnic and economic classes as well, i.e., the blacker you are, and the poorer you are, the more likely it is that you will only have access via your phone. So if you think you're an equal opportunities employer and you're not putting your job stuff via mobile, you're not an equal opportunities employer. That's quite a sobering thought, especially when you consider that 80, over 85% 85 of Fortune 500 companies have practically no mobile support for their site. So, here's our designer again. But what I'd really like you to notice is that he is a Playmobil person. I converted a Playmobil school set into a design studio to set um, some cunning tiny posters and graphics and stuff. And if you were in my workshop, you would have seen those slides. But what I really want to indicate to you about the fact that he's Playmobil is the molding is set, right? There's no changing those. I would have really struggled to have turned like the Playmobil space station set into a design studio, as much as anyone would like to convince me that a design studio, I could have probably done it with a zoo, that might have been all right. But basically the molding is set, there's no changing those, you know, that's how it is. Playmobil is highly detailed. In fact, one of the reasons I'm a bit of a Playmobil geek is because of this level of detail, but it is what it is. Lego, on the other hand, is a smart structural system. It is built to combine in infinite ways. Here's the patent drawing for the original eight stud brick filed in 1958. If you ever wonder why Lego is so expensive compared to other building toys, it's because of their extremely low tolerance for manufacturing glitches. Basically, every piece of Lego that's made has to not only join with every piece of Lego that has ever been made, but every piece of Lego that will ever be made. That's scary to think about. But they do it so that kids can make things like this with no instructions. Right? They, they understand the concept, they understand these things come together, which to me looks a bit like the Winchester Mystery House, so we've kind of gone full circle. 
But the point is that the molds and the shapes are designed to fit together in multiple ways. Each piece is a discrete entity that combines. This, this is what our content needs to do if it is to travel everywhere. Structured chunks that make packages. By breaking down our content into pieces that we can understand, a bit like, a, think about a recipe and the way that goes together, or an article and the fact that you have a headline, a subheading, a body piece, supporting bits and pieces. If we can understand that and we can structure our CMSs like that, we can make content that we can reuse on any number of devices by understanding the display and the system and the UI. How are we going to do this? Good question. I'm so glad you asked. So these are the things we need to think about. To take us to where we need to be, to stand head on and look right into the core of this dazzling multi-device future, we have to make some serious changes to the way we work and our cherished ideals of how the web works, too. There are a number of areas we need to look at to see the whole picture. The concept of content, the tools that we use, and the way we work as people. The importance of value in content. Business value, customer value, economic value cannot be understated. Content is no longer, if it ever was, a nice to have. And your website shouldn't be this black hole into which you throw money to keep it fresh and relevant. Right? You, can do, you can create content that is useful with an actual content plan for interesting content of value to you and your customer. And you can plan this out just in the same way that we know Christmas happens, December. So we have to do shipping and purchasing in a store in August. These things happen regularly. Stuff happens that we're not expecting, but actually, if we work out what happens to us all the time and we can tick that along, map it out, and have a process for it, we can deal with the unexpected much easier. Structured content, in particular, is free content. And not free as in beer, because we just covered that, but free as in a bird. Although, maybe not big bird, because he's been sat on Sesame Street sleeping on twigs for 40 years, but aside from that. Structured content allows you to plan and build for reuse, either by editorial control or by algorithmic fun times, if that's kind of your thing. Orbital content goes one step further, pushing content out to platforms like YouTube and Pinterest and so on, beyond our own, where audiences already exist and gather, to pull them in and to pull in interested parties so it becomes a filtering point. The seminal article on orbital content is when you can find in a list apart and I would recommend you go look it up. But one thing to note with this, measurements like page views and other things like this break this concept of pushing things away and pulling people in. They force us to break our chunks in the wrong places to meet old advertising measurements that are increasingly no longer relevant. Let's talk a little bit about the mobile. Mobile phones and the mobile myth, which is that people that use smartphones are always on the go. This is such rubbish. I don't know about you, but the time that I most use my phone, uh, or, or I'm most lazy with it, to be honest, is I am in my forever lazy onesie. I have a Tigger one and a cat one, so you can choose whichever one you picture me in. It's very attractive, I know. Lying back on my sofa, probably with a half-drunk bottle of beer here and some popcorn perched somewhere up there, so we're getting the full scenario, right? My children are finally asleep. Good combination of cowpole and red wine. Cowpole for them, red wine for me. Um, and I'm watching a film. It's not a great film. I'm kind of half interested in it. And there's someone in the background, right? And I'm thinking, what has she been in? I have seen her in that thing before. And so I pull my phone out of my onesie pocket, and I go to IMDb, and I look up that kind of stuff. Now, the IMDb experience on her phone is OK. It's not great, but it's definitely easier than me pulling my carcass up and walking the 25 meters to my laptop over there. That is the mobile use case. It is people using what is on them, and the phone is the thing that is closest to us. This idea of the second screen is one that's quite interesting to me alongside that. But what I love best is that um, TV producers and film people and so on think that the phone is the second screen. No. No, 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 no. And I wait to see that unravel. So actually, like I said earlier, a significant portion of population is actually mobile only. Uh, and this was of big relevance to the American Cancer Society when a couple of years ago they did a big 
a review of their content, and they realized that there was an interesting simulation between people who, due to the way that the amazing American medical system works, people who have cancer can't always afford to have cancer treatment. That's why we had five seasons of Breaking Bad. Any other country would be like, so you have cancer, here's some treatment. Anyway. The American Cancer Society found that people that didn't have adequate insurance and weren't able to access extremely good treatment were often the people that were mobile-only users. Was this because they were cancer patients on the go? <laughs> no, it's because it's what they had. And they had every right to be able to access the same life-saving information as anyone else. And so they kind of had this idea that maybe their mobile traffic was because people were sat in waiting rooms and reading up and stuff, and you know, should they do like a mobile version of the site? And when they looked into it, it was no. What people were accessing and the fidelity of information they were accessing had nothing to do with what device they were on. It had much more to do with where they were in the journey of their treatment. So you start off in the scenario of someone who has found out that you have cancer. And the first searches that people were doing were things like, am I going to die? because that's what we think of when we think of cancer. That's the fear that everyone has when you hear you're diagnosed with cancer. And they were doing that on a phone, and they were doing it on a laptop and wherever else. But really, that's an intensely private search. That might be one you're not telling anyone else that you're doing. You're being strong for everyone else, but you want to find out yourself. And so these were the initial things that people were finding, you know, information, so they sort of started tuning that kind of stuff. And then the next bit is, well, OK, so I've gone into treatment. I have now want to know what my chances of survival are and what's going to happen next and so on. And they become hyper-learners. And it doesn't matter what device they're from, or even from what social economic class or what education they have, they wanted to access the same level of information. They wanted good quality information that was going to help them make informed choices. And so, you know, suddenly then having PDFs of medical trial data that you can't really read on a phone, that's actually quite offensive on some level. And so the American Cancer Society started looking at how they could make this information readily available across all devices and readable across all devices. And to quote the, uh, the guy that's kind of in charge of that redesign, David Balcom, he said, we felt it was a life-saving imperative to have all of our content available for mobile users. It's a pretty big deal. All right. To go back to some slightly more prosaic stuff, one of the questions that I, I brought up earlier, hey, mobile traffic is increasing, so shouldn't we have a separate app or site to do that? True separation of form and function means that we should have one set of content that we're able to use and reuse across all kinds of platforms, not just web platforms, but to know that we can pull on that resource, adapt it, sure, but pull on that central resource of content, those central messages that mean that we're being consistent across our brand. Forking should be a dirty word when it comes to content. OK? That's how it comes down to. So should we have a separate Apple site? Or more pragmatically, possibly. But you're here at a talk about web content, so I'm guessing you have more than one page of content, right? You haven't got this tiny little interaction stuff that goes around a major app, OK? You come from organizations and from agencies that are dealing with multi-layered stuff in a multi-device world. Having separate apps is not going to answer this. Your mobile site or your mobile app should not be the place you display all the nice things you've picked out and all the content you've swept under the carpet just sort of bobbles underneath it, OK? That's not how this is meant to work. This is your opportunity to go and sort out your non-mobile friendly content because this is where the future is heading. Before we get to the parking lot situation, don't let it be that you get to a parking lot and some poor developer has been left because no one within the organization has sorted out the content in time. So the poor developer has had to write out the error messages that are going to appear, and you get there, and it goes, checksum does not equal. What? 
I run into error messages like this all the time, and they make perfect sense in the context that they're being used. But increasingly, this context is changing and shifting. It's not the one website anymore. It's not the one database. It's not the one thing being called out. OK, so I mentioned Tom Coates earlier, and his, uh, I should tell you he has a love for network-enabled objects. In fact, he has a Pinterest collection at uh, pinterest.com slash Tom Coates network-enabled objects. Uh, and also, you might want to say hello to House of Coates, C-O-A-T-E-S, if you've not come across that. That is his house that tweets. He has a variety of twine bits and pieces set up, heating. He'll tell you when his grumpy fiscus is grumpy and needs watering and that kind of stuff. And it's an interesting experiment with this idea of the, the, the Internet of Things. If you want to see where some stuff is going, Tom, Tom is pushing ahead. I also want to mention Cara McGrain, who is super smart. She works with lots of publishers. She's seen a lot of companies in their underpants, i.e. in their CMS. Um, and she wrote this amazing book. Uh, it's from a book apart called Content Strategy for Mobile. And in this case, mobile is more like a verb than a noun. OK? Buy it now. Read it on your flight home. It's an excellent book. So we, she and I were talking recently about kitchens. We were talking about the Honeywell kitchen computer of the 70s, which I really recommend you go look up if you haven't seen it, and internet fridges, because internet fridges are always funny. She recently told me about an internet toaster, similar to the one that, that was on earlier. Uh, but this was more like it toasted the front page of the New York Times for you, or it put a weather sign on or something. So we were talking about this kind of thing. That's kind of fun. But so we were also talking about these, these kinds of things, like. Uh, Stove, oven, cooker, any other of those words? The Americans use different things, yeah. Uh, and so here's what I would call a hob. Is it a stove top for you or a hob? Or Anyway, so you see that giant space there. Ta-da! Guess what Samsung and others are experimenting with? They are experimenting with video playback on a heat-proof surface. Now. It's kind of funny, right? I get that, because when I first saw it, I was like, that, yeah, right, that's funny. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, this actually makes a ton more sense than the internet fridge. Because the problem with the internet fridge and the idea of having video playback for recipes and stuff like that, which is essentially what they're doing here, is that clearly these people have not spent any time in a kitchen cooking. Because there's a golden triangle of sink, cooker, fridge, and you generally try and keep your heat source away from your cold source for maximum efficiency, which means, and you're all going to see a lovely view of my behind here, I would be cooking here and then turning around like this to try and view what's on my internet fridge to see what to cook. That seems a bit backwards to me. At least in this case, it makes sense that the playback would be there. But what does this mean? Are we going to have proprietary apps for recipe videos? This is really not good news. So this is another one of my content strategy chummets. This is uh, Sarah Walker Butcher. Uh, she's extremely lovely. Uh, and she has a book out with Rosenfield Media called Content Everywhere. I highly recommend you go get it. Um, if the Wi-Fi holds up, you can search for it on Amazon. But one of the things that she and I have in common, and we run into the same sort of clients, and we talk about this stuff a lot, is um, we run into different formats and, and, and things that expect People expect to run on proprietary technology and so on without thinking about how that stuff is going to get out of where it is and the value in it. And we talk a lot about recipe formats. Most content strategists talk about recipe formats like some sort of fetishism because it contains all the things that we love best about content. It has structures. It has things we do with that data. There is data attached to it, timing, you know, volumes, that kind of stuff. It has metadata, so you can go searching for all the recipes that include lamb that take less than 30 minutes. It's an encapsulation of a lot of the problems that we see in content strategy and CMSs and some of the solutions. So when I was thinking about this talk, I was kind of coming up with some stuff. I, I'm a frequent Twitterer. I'm also a frequent potty mouth on Twitter, so do be warned. But I do tend to tweet what's in my head when I'm walking on, working through new talks and articles. And when I was working, writing the first version of this, I was thinking about recipe formats. And I was thinking about device labs and how much I love device labs. I, I went looking for open device labs, and I've only seen one here in Australia that I think is in like, Newcastle or something. Uh, yay, someone, in, woo. Uh, you need more open device labs. Go to opendevicelabs.com, go sign up, form some. Even if you've only got a few devices, it really, really helps. But I was thinking about like the ultimate device lab in which the entire internet of things is gathered in one magic cupboard. What are you doing today? Testing our recipe format by making brownies. Uh, totally had to expense a new kitchen. 
Like, this is what I live for, the idea of us being able to play with this kind of stuff and to work out how to get the things here. But there's a flip side to this as well, which is I tweet when I'm complaining about my inbox. The jobs I turn down without hesitation are the retrofit this content for XXX device ones. No one is ever happy and with good reason. All the time you have to strip out the function from that content and make it do something else, it is a miserable job. So how do we get past this? Let's think about this concept of content. Create structure. Think about the structure and possibilities now. And by that I mean, if you're having a headline for something, it would be a good idea to have a short, medium, and long headline so that you have a short one that appears on a small screen, a medium one that appears on a medium screen, a long one that appears on a desktop or whatever, or on a rolling stripping device, a small one that you can have on your handy pants, fuel band, that kind of thing. All this stuff can be done now, because it's much easier to do it now than to try and put all that structure in later. Think about the atomic structure of articles, of pieces, of galleries, of things like that. What components make these things? How can we split them up but join them together? Like Lego, not Playmobil. So that means chunks. Chunks, not blobs. And also it means contents, not content. Content is not this amorphous blob that turns up at the end of a project and gets poured like this sort of sedimentary layer on top of a website and sinks down to the right sort of place. That does not happen. It takes requirements and understanding to work out where these pieces are going to go and what you can use and reuse. So build in the flexibility now. I mentioned the short, medium, long headlines. You can also have SEO slash journalistic headlines. A great example of this is Netflix. Netflix is on over 400 devices when I last went and checked. I'm sure it's not now. But they only have three or four template types. For every single one of the episodes you go and read, if you see it on your phone, you see the episode description, you see the short version. If you see it on a tablet, you see it on a medium version, and also on a PS3 and things like that. If you're looking on the desktop or you're reading like their equivalent of like the TV Times or whatever that shows you what's going on, that's the longer sort of critic's description of stuff. And that's how they create this stuff for each. They don't write it for each and every device. They just made sure that they had the structure. And where they get the idea from, if you, you know, wind it back far enough, goes to a, a magazine in the 1950s in America, which was like the most popular magazine. Um, you know, forget Time magazine and things like that. It was, it was TV Guide. And they published a magazine each week with what the TV listings were going to be for the 700 cable channels that were in the 1950s in America. Um, I don't think 700, but whatever. Um, but the thing was, they realized that the value was not actually in the magazine they were creating, because any, any could go and print a magazine. That was not hard. It was actually in what they knew about these programs. And so at great expense in the 60s, they bought a mainframe computer, and they had all their writers fill in a short, medium, and long version of those episodes. Even though they might only use one or two of those in a magazine at any time, they had them, and they, they saved them. And the magazine was eventually sold for something like $5, but the mainframe and the information it contained was sold for significantly more. And now if you look on Netflix or anything that has an EPG system that allows you to read uh, stuff that's coming on, and it's something of North American um, origin, and it's from before the 1972 or so, you are probably reading the description that was by those TV guide writers back in the 50s. So that's pretty cool. That's a good reuse of content, I think we can all agree. And that means doing the hard work now. It's much easier to put in additional structure for stuff that you can't necessarily foresee than it is to try and add it in later. And you need to make it part of the workflow. And that means explaining to your content creators why those additional fields are important so they don't just copy and paste the same thing into each one. Like no one sits down with the content creators and does really thorough training as to where their content could possibly go. It feels like this weird, disconnected silo that we get put in. Oh, they're the people that write the stuff. Yeah, they don't, they don't need to know about how the CMS works. We'll make it really easy for them. Which is where WYSIWYG stuff comes along, which is a pile of shit. I will get on to that. They aren't just the writers. We have values, too. And that means also being platform agnostic. Sometimes native apps are the answer. Like Scott said, sometimes the, the native stuff that comes first is the answer to build your other platform, and that's fine. But make sure that you're keeping that separate form and function right from the start so you can reuse that content without it being buried into that particular thing. 
Let's talk a little bit about the tools we use then. I do hope I'm not going to run over. How long have I got left? OK. All right, we're all good. <coughs> so yes, CMSs. Here are some CMSs. I hate CMSs. There are a few that I like a bit. The one that I like the most is Perch, uh, which is a little content management system because it has no particular WYSIWYG shenanigans going on. It's very smart for what I want to do. So shout out for Perch. Like, there's text boxes. I can make small editions. But my major work when I do stuff with Perch happens elsewhere. The same with Drupal as well, for the most part. So WYSIWYG is a way of avoiding disrupting these silos I talked about and having teams of creators together. In fact, content creators have more in common with the designers and developers than they do with inbound marketing teams most of the time. Trying to solve this relationship, this communication, and ditch the design talk by using WYSIWYG is a lie. It encourages blobs. It's where we have, instead of saying a designer and a content creator sitting together going, this bit is really important. I think it should maybe be boxed out, or we should think of a way to develop the template to um, acknowledge the stuff. What happens is that the designer doesn't talk to the content creator. The content creator is filling in stuff in the box, so they use pink and comic sans to show how important it is. And then the, de the designer goes, oh, why would you choose that? No one told me not to. Besides, I like pink and comic sans. It's good. So headings and the like should be structured by template and by metadata and by that kind of thing, not by an interface in a huge blob. And this is a big change for content creators. Like, they don't like it. I will fully admit that. This is hard stuff. But the truth is found in that preview. When you hit that preview button, it shows you the desktop site. The desktop site is just another platform. Why would you weigh that one any higher than your mobile or your tablet or any of the other things? An interim might be multiple views. And I encourage CMS makers to generally do that to allow us to see different things. And I think there's some, some fun JavaScript stuff that can be done to help with that as well. But really, what would be better is an understanding of how the CMS populates content, which is what we're lacking. And how many of our content CMSs are set up to do this? Pretty much none. There are some that are good, but definitely not out of the box. Drupal has some really good structured stuff going on. but doesn't get used that way that often. So many companies never tweak the CMS. It gets installed, and that's how it is. Or someone in IT tweaks it without considering or even talking to the authors. And the authorship experience of, being, of using that CMS day in, day out is terrible. I have worked with content creators who have all kinds of post-it notes around their monitor to kind of direct them to clodges that they need to go around. Karen McGrain once described the inside, the, the usability of CMSs, that authorship experience, as the, the enterprise software that UX forgot. It's very true. Most CMSs are incredibly painful to use. Or, to quote Karen again, the interfaces look like a database got drunk and threw up. Also, inline editing is not the answer. I tend towards the pragmatic, but on the idea of inline editing, I am pretty emphatic. It just furthers the impression that what you are creating right now is what that content will be, or what it will ever be, or ever have to be. If inline editing dies in a fire tomorrow, I will not be sad. The only time I've ever seen it used to any reasonable effect, which doesn't really even count in this kind of thing, is in profiles and stuff like that, where you're editing a very small amount of information on the fly. That's it. Like, go and correct a typo with inline editing if you must. But don't try and have people sort of create on the fly in that kind of way. It's, it's not good. It's like being fed sugar constantly. OK, so our tools. So I've mentioned a true separation of form and content. And, and the reason I bring this up is previously in the bad old days, the webmaster was responsible for getting this you know, getting everything up on the, the site. And then the CMS was a way of unclogging this bottleneck. CSS dealt with the styling, and the author dealt with the stuff. And this gave way to the web department just basically stopping caring about the what, because they, had to, they only had to deal with the how at that point. So we end up in this situation, which is like, I've done my job. I'm good. I'm all, I'm all fine. Our tools, our writing tools, need to be designed for writing and not styling. So many of our CMSs look like this, right? Familiarity breeds content. No, you've got the quote wrong. The quote was fine as it, as it began. Because all this does is says that this is the printed page. It's not printed page. Imagine the site is like this huge spread out array of stuff. 
and the device you're using helps you move from one bit of it to another. It's not some printed page that we're scrolling down or opening like a book or things like that. Different views, different requirements, different stuff being pulled in is not a printed page. And this suggests that people are creating books. It's actually easier than ever to educate our authors and stakeholders on the need to invest in future-friendly content tools because it is an investment. You can show them the current site on a smartphone or a tablet. That often really works. Like, the, if the internet currently had an interpretive dance, it would be this. Because that's what we have to do, right? That's not good. I mean, it's quite funny now that when, when my, um, my kid, he's now four, but when he was two, I have a video of him pinch zooming a magazine because that's what he thinks the world does for him. It's very sweet, but it's also not very smart. Okay, talk about multiple platform publishing. The ability to sensibly reuse content by having it in containers that are platform agnostic. So examples of that that I like, and there are more coming out all the time, things like gather content, it's a great one that allows you to create an authorship experience and collaboration and then use an API to push out to a CMS. So the CMS can do what it does best, which is manage content assets. That's what CMSs are really good at. They're not good at being writing stuff because that's not what the people who built them are good at doing. If you want to have really good writing stuff, go and talk to people that write. That's how Get Editorially got, editorially got made, is that you know, people who did a lot of writing were like, the way that we have to write stuff and collaborate is shit. The best we've got is Google Docs. If Google Docs is the best collaboration tool you have, we need some better tools. And thankfully, there are some now coming out. So there'll be, there'll be a bit of a scrap in this space, I think, for people to work out what there is. But supporting things like Markdown and so on will be really valuable. And pixel by pixel control is not the answer anymore. We have to give up some of the perfectionism that, well, I say we have had a designers. You've seen my slides. I am not a designer you have had as designers. We need to work in chunks rather than tiny pixelated units of bits and pieces. And that's hard for us to give up as well. So while the content creators are struggling with the idea of not being able to manipulate the text in the way they have, you kind of have to wrestle with this idea that you might not know every single version of everything and be OK with that. And it's going to take us time to get to that. We're not there yet. So if I have any CMS makers in the room, I have this slide just to run through really quickly because I think it's important. Drop the hard hardcore WYSIWYG. You are doing no one any favors. Slim it down if you need to. Add in Markdown, make it optional, but give people the option to use it so they can learn new stuff. Preview at multiple viewports so that you're not just showing people the desktop version of the site. The desktop is now a native app, increasingly. Give the content creators the best experience to create their best work. That might mean, shockingly, you not having a writing environment, but using, collaborating with someone like Gather Content or Get Editorially and helping them develop an API to pull stuff in. You are really good at managing content assets. Keep doing that. Stop making shitty Microsoft Word ripoffs, because Microsoft Word was really shitty to start with. And make it easy to create packages of content to serve up. I am not a software designer. I'm not going to tell you how to do your job to do that. But test and test and test again. Come ask me questions. I will tell you my personal experiences. I'm happy to do that. But find ways to make this better, because this is what we need to do. I know this is hard, right? But if we're going to get to the bit that Scott talked about, and I really want us to get to the bit that Scott talked about, because fuck me, that key thing looked amazing. I am always forgetting my key. Can you imagine wandering in drunk and being like, huh, open my phone. <laughs> That I need that, right? I'm always leaving my keys places. I mean, I'll leave, lose my phone and end up sleeping in the gutter, obviously, but you know. So I know this stuff is hard, but if we can aim towards it incrementally, start building these content chunks, these packages, stripping out what we think is the function and keeping it to the form, we'll be good. There will be days like these when you are having this conversation with clients and they'll be like, <laughs> we just want an iPad app. Why are we having this conversation about light bulbs? OK? Here's why. Because as a content strategist, what I am most usually is a counselor. I go in and I sit with content people who suddenly have to do all this web stuff that they didn't really sign up for, that they want to be good at because they want to be good at their job, but they're finding it difficult because the tools don't work for them. And the biggest problem they have is that they're left alone to solve this stuff. They don't get to talk to the designers and developers as much as they'd like. Sometimes they even sit with them. They still don't get to talk to them as much as they like. So these guys are clearly total douches. But at least they have gathered around the same computer to celebrate themselves, right? 
Very few companies do this. This is presumably why you have never made a website for $239. There is the answer. There is assumed to be this amazing trickle-down of skills with the training that we do. That a day's training on the CMS and learning a little bit of CSS and so on, and an editorial style guide will somehow filtrate the entire company and everyone will be proliferating fantastic pieces of content that the content marketers can get excited about. This is bullshit. This doesn't happen. People go back to what they were doing before because it's what they know. We need to support them in these changes. We need you, I need you to support your content creators and go back and say, I understand that your job is just as shitty as mine, just in a slightly different way. They can help you make your job less shitty by writing stuff for you that you can use. You can help make their job less shitty by helping them with these, understanding these changes. Because it's scary and hard and really difficult to get your head around, to be honest. This means multidisciplinary teams, designers, developers, content designers, content creators, writers, photographers, infographic creators, whoever you want to be or whatever you want to do, all together as a team. That is what a web team really means now. If they're not with you, they need to be with you. And like I said, this stuff is not easy. I have not yet, and God knows I've looked, I have not found a make this shit easy button in any CMS I've looked. Neither is there one in the boardroom meeting when you go talk about it and when you're working through the structures you need to create. But you are all here. You are smart people. If you manage this, you will be light years ahead of your competitors. They have no idea any of this shit coming. Like you can be the people that do this stuff. So I leave you with this. There are, on any of these types of things, whether it's stuff we're doing now or stuff we're looking to do in the future, multiple pervasive user needs between your end users, your content creators, your business stakeholders when it comes to content. Map them to tasks. Work out what's priority and what is hot air. What are the user needs? As a user, I want to compare product sizes. What are the creator needs? As a creator, I want to create content that can be easily updated and repurposed. What are the stakeholder needs? As a stakeholder, I want to measure the impact versus cost. It's a very small example of that kind of thing, but this is what I do with all of my projects. I try and map out this stuff and understand all these differing requirements coming at me as the person that's going to fix the content. God knows how I love that title. This is what I want you to do. Be the advocate for this kind of change. It's hard. People need supporters. I need you to go read up more on this stuff, go look things out, seek it out, go look at different CMSs, even if you've never really done that before, and understand the change that's coming. If you want to build cool shit and you want that cool shit to work, you're going to need people like me to help you make it work. Okay? Sign language and interpretive dance is not going to do it. Understand the reasons for change that go along that, and understand the practicalities of change that go alongside that. And understand that you won't do this overnight, but it is the direction of travel. This is where things are going. And be the person in your organization who says, I can help you with this. None of us know the next device or the next cool thing, but we don't need to. We don't need to know these next devices and next things. We, just, we build teams, we build tools, and we build content that adapts whatever the conduit, and the rest will make sense of itself. Thank you very much.